I want to thank you for not telling the score of that Air Force Carolina football game, the Gator Bowl of 63. No one here remembers it. I've been trying to forget it for 52 years, 10 months, and 22 days. I was a halfback out at the Air Force Academy. The slice game took place against one of my home state teams, University of North Carolina. And I thought that'd be the greatest way in the world to end 11 years of organized football. Well, as tradition would have it, after the game, they gave us a watch. It had a little football and an alligator in the middle of it. And every time I looked at mine, it read 35 to nothing. <laughs> Cooper, don't blame me for not laughing. No, that was the score of the ball game. We didn't think it was too funny either. <laughs> yeah. Now, that season was not a total loss. We, uh, we don't have any Nebraska fans here that would admit it, do we? Uh, you, you're not going to like this story. We, meaning this little Air Force team, traveled to Lincoln, Nebraska the fall of 63, about mid-October. Nebraska was undefeated and nationally ranked. We were unranked. We didn't have a chance of being ranked. We outweighed over 50 pounds per person. We won that game in the last two minutes. Now think about it. To beat the Big Red in Lincoln, when they're undefeated and in the top 10. We had to get out of town in a hurry. <laughs> it's the only game Nebraska lost 63 season. They beat Auburn in the Orange Bowl. They ended up number five in the nation. We denied them the national championship. Some people like to applaud at this point. Yeah. Come on, guys. Um, so, the impossible is possible, right? We had absolutely no chance. It was totally impossible, and somehow we did it. The impossible is sometimes possible. And that's a great lesson for all of us. Um, our Navy friends, where are the Navy? Good. Well, we've already beat Navy this year. And where are the Army guys and girls? And the last we heard, it was 10 nothing. Uh, we're, what is it, 10 6? Okay, well, you guys are coming along. Coming along. <laughs> coming along. Good, good luck. <laughs> um, is Jim Roberts still in the room? Okay, well, now I can say nice things about him. But anyway, Jim uh, started, headed, the, uh, headed up the American Conservative Union back in January of 74, and I ran for Congress that year in North Carolina, and Jim was brave enough to, to be one of the few to support my run, so we've been uh, doing things together for 40 years. And is uh, Bill Chatfield here? Um, I think he's outside. Bill is, is late again. So uh, uh, Bill is uh, one of my dearest friends, a Marine, and of course, Jim was Navy, and, and I'm always confused about it. The, uh, the Navy is a part of the Marines, is that right? <laughs> no, Chat, Chatfield's always telling me that the Marines represent the men's department of the Navy. <laughs> okay, we're already behind schedule, and uh, we're short on time, so that'll be all the jokes. Another applause. Uh, another reason I'm happy to be here, April of 1972, I really shouldn't have made it. One of those times. Uh, I, um, uh, my very first mission over Hanoi, 16 April 72, there were three SAMs. That's a surface air missile about the size of a telephone pole, and they were accelerated up at our airplanes at some 15, 1600 miles an hour. They would proximity fuse, detonate, and be lethal, be deadly, within about 150 feet. And on my very first mission, three of them came within 100 feet of our airplane, failed to go off, failed to detonate. Thank goodness for that Soviet quality control, would you agree? <laughs> but there were many other times, and really had it not been for tens of thousands of people in the entire military and civilian support community who were, who were proud of their work, who performed it in a professional, outstanding manner, Steve Ritchie would not be a fighter ace, and I probably would not be alive. So as you can imagine, I'm, uh, I'm pretty thankful, pretty grateful. 
who were very fortunate to receive so much of the credit that belongs to so many who helped make it all possible. There are many, many fighter pilots who could have done what I did, but we had a unique opportunity in the air combat arena, and there were some reasons for our success at the time, given that opportunity, and you know what they are. Preparation, teamwork, discipline, dedication, education, training, communication, enthusiasm. <laughs> Attitude, 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 will, determination, integrity, and surely most will agree that those are the elements, the ingredients, the keys that go into the makeup of what? Success, achievement, quality, excellence, top gun performance, in anything that we do, personal or professional. So in the final analysis, it's people and a wide array of support functions who are trained and motivated and ready and willing to do the job, who ultimately make it possible for us to win rather than to lose, to succeed rather than to fail, and sometimes, sometimes to live rather than to die. And that gets to be pretty important, doesn't it? General Patton said we fight with machinery, but we win with people. We win with people. I really am convinced that people can and will do great things. They'll reach for the stars when motivated by inspired leadership. I'd like to tell you for just a few minutes about three of the great leaders that I had the wonderful privilege to fly with and work for. The Wing Commander at Udarn, Thailand in 1972 was a young colonel named Charlie Gabriel. Ten years later, he was the chief of our Air Force. The Vice Wing Commander was Jerry O'Malley. He became the Vice Chief. Commander of Pacific Air Forces, then Commander of Tactical Air Command when he was tragically killed in an airplane accident in the spring of 1985. He would surely have been the chief. There was an Army One Star there with whom we worked, began his career in the enlisted ranks of the Minnesota National Guard, became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Jack Vesey. These three people, these three individuals had that I don't know what you call it, Jim. I talk about it so much, I don't know what to name it. It's that special quality, I guess, that, that inspires the desire for excellence in almost everyone who's around them. You know people like that? <laughs> We'd have done almost anything for Charlie Gable, Jerry O'Malley, Jack Vesey. And I know a lot of people find this stack Next statement, hard to understand. Some of you will, because you know it to be true. I would have died for them. So would many of my colleagues. And some did. Some did. That's a pretty special brand of loyalty, isn't it? Because I'll tell you what, there are a lot of people I don't feel that way about. A whole lot of people. <laughs> What is it? Have you thought about it very much? What is it that commands such loyalty? Well, a part of it is we admired them, we respected them, we loved them, we did. We'd have done almost anything for them. And yet, maybe more important than anything else, we knew that loyalty cut both ways. We knew when things really got tight, when we got into a jam, into a bind. We could count on them just as much as they knew they could count on us. That loyalty cut both ways. And it's so important for us to think about what is it in others that inspires us to do our best and to be our best? And then try to be that way for those who look to us for leadership and guidance and counsel and inspiration. I like the author who wrote, I love you not only for, for what you are, but for what I am when I'm around you? No, for, for what I am when I'm around you. Don't you see, we were better people when we were around Charlie Gabriel, Jerry O'Malley, Jack Vesey. We did a better job, we worked harder, communicated better, more creative. You know what else? We had a heck of a lot more fun. Because it is fun to work for people like that, isn't it? 
those of us in leadership and management and supervisory positions have such important responsibilities because we have either a very positive, a very mediocre, or a very negative effect on people and the lives of people. That's what? Performance, productivity, creativity, communication, bottom line mission accomplishment. And it's more important today than it's ever been, isn't it? When we need to be as productive as we can be, in most cases now with fewer resources, right? It's never been more important. Bill Danforth, the founder of Ralston Purine, always used to challenge the people in his company to stand tall, to think tall, to smile tall, and to live tall. Aren't these kind of people we have in the room here today? Why? Wow, because you're up, you're proud, you're happy, you're courteous, you're creative, you communicate better. You like to work. I know it's a new concept in so many quarters these days, isn't it? Unfortunately but you like to work, and that spirit is contagious. In the score for Vagabond King, Rudolph Frommel wrote, give me 10 who are stout-hearted, and soon I'll give you 10,000 more. That spirit is contagious. How many ask about the 8th of July, 1972, when we're down two MiG-21s in a minute, 29 seconds? because it's such a great example of how all of the elements of the team effort come together to produce an incredible vi victory. I wish I had video or color film to show. The last thing that happened that morning before we taxied is the crew chief came up the ladder to let me know we didn't have any film for the camera. We are in an F4E model with a gun and a gun camera. Most of the time I was in a D model without a gun camera. And I said, what do you mean, chief, there's no film? He said, we're out of film, there's no film on base. Well, I thought about that for a moment. I said, I guess that's okay. I, I doubt we'll see MiGs today anyway. See? Another good lesson. Because we never know, do we? We never know what's just around the corner. That's why it's so important to be as prepared as we can possibly be in every area in our lives because we never know and we need to be ready. And whether we like it or not, whether the main media likes it or not, whether Republicans and Democrats and conservatives and liberals like it or not, whether high school teachers and college professors like it or not, as most of you know, we're in combat. We're in combat. And it's a war of good versus evil, right versus wrong, freedom versus slavery. Civilization versus chaos. Think about the fact that tens of millions of young people right now all over the world are being taught to hate us and to kill us, to convert us, or to eliminate us. And they can chop off our heads and put it on television and brag about it all over the world. And as the great Paul Harvey from Jim Roberts' hometown of Chicago on the radio for 50 years used to say, we have to tiptoe around their sensibilities. You remember the slaughter at Fort Hood a few years ago? The terrorist attack on Fort Hood a few years ago? Exactly, our Pentagon. Our DOD, our Department of Defense for five or six years called it workplace violence. What's the matter, folks? If we can't even say the name of our enemy, how are we ever going to defeat our enemy? Mariana's gonna tell you in just a few minutes about the fact that evil prevails when good people do nothing. Now, I want to tell you about the 8th of July, 1972. I'm sorry, the uh, 28th of, uh, of uh, about the Roger Locker rescue, the 2nd of June in 1972. Some of you who have been to these meetings before have heard me tell this story. 
in fact i've told it over fifty five hundred times the last forty years because it is one of the great great rescue stories of all time incredibly inspirational when one of our guys in the triple nickel went down uh, sixty miles northwest of hanoi and he was missing for twenty three days and we finally made radio contact and General Va John Vogt, the four-star commander of 7th Air Force, who had been a fighter race in World War II, canceled the entire strike mission to Hanoi and ded dedicated every single resource, including over 150 airplanes, to go get Roger Locker. And he was rescued and brought back to Udarn, Thailand without a single loss. One of the greatest rescues ever. So if you wanna, if you wanna hear it, see it, it's on YouTube, it's about seven and a half minutes. Just look up Roger Locker, along with my name, the Roger Locker, L-O-C-H-E-R. You can Google, you can Google me and Roger Locker, and you can uh, hear and and see the story of the uh, Roger Locker rescue. You know, one of the great things about it, it was in the tradition of the fact that we never leave our folks behind. And I'm not supposed to say this, but we did it in Benghazi, didn't we? We left our folks behind. And Marianne and I have been to um, Aviano, Italy, and we've talked to the F-16 commanders there. And they could have been there. They could have been there. And yet they were told to stand down. I tell you, a bunch of F-16s at a couple hundred feet in 500 knots would have done the job without even firing a shot. But we didn't have the guts. We didn't have the guts to go try to rescue our people. So now Mariana is going to tell you what it was like to live under communism, under a brutal communist dictator, what it was like to live without freedom, dreaming of freedom, dreaming that maybe the Americans would come to rescue them next. Because you see, when we were fighting in Vietnam, I didn't realize that halfway around the world, people in Eastern Europe who were living under communism were hopeful. When we were fighting the communists, we were fighting their worst enemy, and they were hopeful that maybe, maybe we would come to rescue them next. And she was able to get out 30 years ago while it was still communist. And we, we just went back a couple months ago, and it was a very painful and difficult journey. And she's going to tell you about it. Thank you. At first sight, I'm just a general's little wife, but beyond that, I am the oppressed that you rescued America. And the American who fights alongside you to keep our freedom from slipping through our fingers. I come from a communist Romania and an oppressed Romania. While American children were learning to love and trust themselves, we learned to hate, trust no one, control every word we said because our life depended on it. We were waiting in line for hours for a piece of bread and sometimes water. The communists believe in spreading the wealth, take from the rich and give to the poor. And that paralyzed the economy. It's not working because the rich or the people who had something didn't want to work anymore when it was all taken away from you, from them. And the poor didn't want to work because they were getting something for nothing. And that only lasted until they ran out of other people's money. Don't try it. Learn from other countries' mistakes. They were big spenders. 
they spent money like there was no tomorrow, and they were trying to fix spending by spending even more and printing money. So their money lost their value. The communist healthcare, the socialist healthcare, killed many. One of my first memories as a child was that of holding the hand of a dying man who was a friend and a neighbor, and my grandmother crying, saying there's nothing more we can do for him, just help him die. And I can still feel his hand getting cold and stiff in my hand, and he, the look of death in his eyes is still haunting me. All he needed was a simple surgery, which here in America is an outpatient surgery. And there he was considered too old to be worth saving, and he was only in his 60s. Um, knowing that my grandfather was a priest, I was threatened with all kinds of things for going to church, and that only made me go to church even more, and it was not courage. It was despair. I wanted to provoke them, to get them to come after me and finally kill me, get it done and over with. We were not allowed to say Merry Christmas. We had to say Happy Holidays. We couldn't call the trees Christmas trees. We had to call them holiday trees. God was not allowed in school, or you weren't allowed to talk about God at all. Uh, guns were illegal. The first thing the communists did, they took away the guns. You know you're in trouble when your government is going after your guns. And uh, just 30 years ago, um, I came to America. This time, this year, was the first time that I went back. And um, visiting my hometown, I went to the cathedral that I used to go to when I was a child. And I saw something new. On the walls of the cathedral, there were marble plaques with the names and pictures and the story of the people who were killed in the Romanian Revolution in 1989. And I am haunted by their faces. Those people were killed by their own government. And they couldn't defend themselves because they had no guns. They had no guns. One, who was 22 years old, about your age, just a little older, was killed and shot on the steps of the cathedral simply for singing a song that the government did not approve of and for waving the American flag and the Romanian flag with the communist symbol cut out of it. Learn from other countries' mistakes. Being back there, um, it was a surprise for me because they've been free for 27 years and the country is in shambles. I thought they'd be better off. I thought I'd find out, find a better Romania. And yes, they're free, but they don't know what to do with the freedom. So I realized that they're limited by the way they're thinking. They've been so brainwashed by their government. They've been so dependent on the government that now they have freedom and they don't know what to do with it. Their properties and houses have been given back. The government's out of the picture. And they're looking at their houses falling apart. And they can't think for themselves, I have to repair this. So being there, I realized just what makes America so great. Because America is the greatest country in the world. And I don't care whose feelings that hurt because I did not go through hell to come to America and not be able to speak up my mind. And what makes America the greatest is not just the, the fact that it's uh, physically so prosperous, but it's also an idea. America is so much more than just a country, than a physical place. America is mankind's longing for itself. And that puts America above all others. 
we grew up dreaming of American fighter jets, American troops that would come to blow us up, blow up every wall, every brick, level everything until there was nothing left standing because we were so oppressed. Life had no meaning without freedom. And we would have given the Americans anything in exchange for freedom. Our lives, our heart and souls. As a little girl, I did not dream of um, Prince Charming coming on a horse to rescue me and carrying me off to his castle. Instinctively, I knew I needed a lot more than that. I needed an American fighter pilot. <laughs> that would come. <laughs> blow up everything. <laughs> and fly me to America in a fighter jet. And I am so lucky to be able to spend the rest of my life with him. I had no idea he was gonna be that cute. <laughs> <laughs> but it, everything, anything's possible in America. And just when I think my life cannot get any better than this, guess what? One of my other heroes, James McKitchen, is right here, sitting here, would you mind standing so everyone can see you, please? Sir. I grew up watching his movies. The communists and the oppression can censor things, can try to control everything, but they cannot control every little thing. And James's fame and great movies made it through the Iron Curtain and brightened up our, our days, our thoughts, and uh, gave us an inside look at the American life, the great American life that we so longed for. I know you hear all kinds of things about the Vietnam War, that it was in vain, all kinds of negative things, but I want to set the record straight. With every move Americans made in Vietnam, we behind the Iron Curtain felt the Soviet grip lose its strength, and it gave us time to breathe and stay alive. And because you, America, kept the Soviets busy in Vietnam, they lost track of us. And there's no more evil empire, thanks to you. I would like to also give you the, the inside look on how the world looks at you. The world does not see black or white rich or poor, Republican or Democrats. All the world cares about is that you're Americans. You're one, you're rescuers. The world is a better place because you're in it. If it weren't for you, we'd be speaking German or Russian. So be proud of who you are. There's absolutely nothing wrong to stand proud and say, yes, I'm an American and I am the best. And you are not just the best, you're the best of the best because you are in the military, in the American military. And there are millions of people out there that are hoping that you'll go rescue them next. So when you hear all these negative things on TV about America, don't believe them. You know better. Don't let them brainwash you that way. America is the best, the greatest country in the world because they're the only ones who go out there to risk their lives for people who don't even, they don't even know. 
and they never ask for anything in exchange. Maybe just a little piece of land to bury their dead. That's what makes America the greatest and puts them above all others. Coming to America was a dream come true. And um, there's one more thing that I, I have to say. I had a picture of the American flag that I would take out sometimes back in Romania and stare at it dreaming of what it would be like to be free, to live in America, what a hamburger tastes like, or cheesecake. <laughs> and I took it to class. It, um, I got caught by the teacher, and I got to hide the flag in spite of all the threats. I did not surrender the American flag because I knew it was going to be destroyed. And I could, couldn't care whether I lived or died, but I couldn't afford to lose the hope that the American flag gave me. I was going to die to protect the American flag. And then later on, I come to America. We're watching some Americans burn their own flag. And that hurt me more than anything else that has been done to me under a communist. And I don't understand any of it because you're allowed to destroy and, and burn the flag, but you're not allowed to defend it. If you try to defend some, the American flag that's being burned, did you know that you go to jail? And that shocked the hell out of me. I did not expect that. So maybe when you, you take over the country, you can do better. You can set the record straight. So I'm being told I have to end it. <laughs> I don't have time to say more than I was going to say. But America is everything we ever imagined and more. Um, Americans are the kindest people in the world. I felt more welcome here than I have been back in Romania. Um, I would like to put a face to the oppressed people from all over the world and say thank you for everything you've done, you're doing, and you will be doing for not just us here, but for the oppressed people all over the world. Thank you. It does make a difference. And America is the best and the greatest. Stand up for her. She's worth it. There's nowhere else to go. God bless you and God bless America.